throne of grace. Wonderful place that it is, the throne of grace. We confess, God, there's nothing in ourselves to commend us to you, but we confess the greatness of Jesus Christ, his sinless, broken body, infinitely precious, shed blood, paid the world's sin debt in full. Where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. We ask for your help today, God, to receive your word. Anoint me to do a good job teaching from your precious Bible. Anoint every heart and every mind to receive truth. And Lord, we pray a special prayer for the Sunday school class. We ask you to minister to the little ones and empower the teachers there so that little lives are changed and faith is built in Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, our coming Savior, our, our very best friend. In his name, amen. Praise the Lord. Once again, and God bless you all, thank you for joining us here today. So you probably see that pastor is a little emotional. Don't ask me about it. Just pray about it, <laughs> please. Prayer changes things. God is not far off and unconnected, disconcerned with the planet. How do you know? There's an empty cross and an empty tomb that tells you he's not done. He is involved. He does care about us. And things change. Things change. I remember taking a course at CMU, and the professor there was some kind of, uh, some kind of theistic evolutionist. He said, I can't believe in special creation. Is God that much of an interventionist? He isn't in my life. That's what he said. I said, you poor man, he is in mine. <laughs> he is a living reality day by day, and, and he answers prayer, and he does things. And he changes things, and we just can't imagine the stupendous changes he has slated for planet Earth and for all those who love and trust him. We must look ahead to these things. Preach to myself, too, on that one. Well, friends, we're going to be in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6. If you could just turn to the book of Judges 6. Now I think I will take that. Okay. Book of Judges, chapter 6. Now you remember that um, this time block here we're call that we call the time of the judges, or the judges period, uh, it's a time in Israel's history when there's no, uh, no king. There's no king there. There's no centralized personal leadership. Moses is gone. Joshua is gone. Uh, there is a functioning priesthood. There is a, a tabernacle. They could go to the functioning priesthood for instructions from God if they wanted to, but everybody just started meandering around doing their own thing, human autonomy. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And of course, this is what? A recipe for absolute disaster. Personal disaster. Societal disaster. You don't just determine for yourselves right and wrong, good and bad. We must consult God. And Israel refused to do these things, and God already warned them what would happen. You, you rebel against me, you meander away from me as my covenant people, I will punish you, and the punishment will come in the form of what? Gentile hostility, aggression, and suppression. It's exactly what happened here. Israel here in uh, Judges 6 has been oppressed They've been dominated now by Midian. It's just one pagan nation after another. Well, now it's Midian. Seven years of oppression under the Midianites. And let's look at the scene here. Look at Judges 6, beginning in verse 3. Let's get the, the picture of what's happening. Verse 3, So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them, and they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. 
and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep or ox or donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. We're going to be, for the next few weeks, we're going to be walking with a man named Gideon. Gideon is God's chosen man to remedy this horrible situation that Israel is under right now, living through. But, uh, of course, this is supposed to be a Bible overview, and uh, we want to somehow get through this in this lifetime. But sometimes you just need to stop and you need to consider what's here because the exploits of Gideon, the situation he found himself in, these are terribly, terribly important. They're very relevant to our own day. And some of this language here is just very, very important for us to stop and take notice of and to apply to our own hearts, minds, lives, living right now in 2018. This phrase here in verse 6, Israel was greatly impoverished. I want you to think about that they were greatly impoverished. In this context, we are talking about physical resources here, ox and sheep and produce of the land and and wealth and so on. We're talking physical resources, but I think that the Bible would have us, and the God who wrote the Bible would have us, to understand that what's being said here, it actually hints at spiritual, moral, and intellectual realities that we need to be aware of right now. You can, see, you can be greatly impoverished and still have lots of money. You can be greatly impoverished and have three cars in the garage and a big fat bank account. And guess what? You can still be dirt, dirt poor intellectually, morally, spiritually. You remember the Lord Jesus. He had some words of, uh, of correction, strong words of correction for the church of the Laodiceans. Remember that? You people think you're rich? You think you've got it all together? You think you're uh, self-sustaining and autonomous? Forget it. You are wretched. You are poor and blind, and you need to come to me and, and purchase for yourselves some real riches, the stuff that really matters, the things of eternal significance. This language here of people becoming greatly impoverished, that reminds me of some things that Paul wants to say in the book of Colossians, and I'll just invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, and um, whenever I hear about people being spoiled or robbed or impoverished, I always go in my mind to Colossians, the second chapter, because Paul is very concerned, and, and the Holy Spirit that moved Paul was very concerned that Christ's church would become impoverished, not of gold or silver or, or of things that perish, but real wealth, real riches. Let's look at Colossians, and, and you know what, we'll start in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and let's read these verses here. Now, interesting, Paul's going to mention these Laodiceans that I just mentioned, who, beca- who actually became impoverished spiritually. Colossians 2, 1, for, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Guess who that includes? Us. I mean, these are words that we're supposed to read 2,000 years later and think about, meditate upon, and try desperately under God to apply to our lives. I mean, this is just not any other book here, right? I mean, this is the Word of God. This is God's heart on the matter. And we're gathered here not to waste time, but to, but to hear from God and to ask for His help today. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Note the language, riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware. Keep your eyes open. Watch out now. Beware. 
lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is head of all principality and power. That is a very, very powerful ten verses of Scripture. You learn that Jesus Christ is very God of very God. In him are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Jesus is the one in whom you are complete. You are complete in him. And in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ are treasures, to put it mildly, treasures accessible to us by faith. Unspeakably great treasures of wisdom and knowledge and purpose and acceptance with God and assurance of these things and the peace that all this brings. Treasures, treasures, among other things. And Paul says, watch out, don't get, don't get robbed. Don't get your treasure taken away. You see, you and I have these treasures because we come to Jesus in faith. And in fact, we begin with a faith commitment to Jesus in all our reasoning. You don't reason your way to God. You know, maybe I've said this before. I'm sure I have. You don't say, oh, well, I'm going to sit down in autonomous human fashion here, and I'm going to examine all the evidence, and, uh, and then oh, finally, finally, I think that God is reliable after all, after I've already tried him. No, we don't do that. We start with a faith commitment to Jesus. We recognize him as the only appropriate foundation from which we may set to the task of learning anything. I mean, if you're going to learn something, if you're going to get down to the job of making rational inquiry, and you're going to determine what's to be believed and what isn't, what will you accept and what won't you accept, guess what? You need somebody to give you some guidance on how to get the process started. You can't just leap out into this on your own. You need someone who knows infinitely more than you to help. And he gets you started to the task of learning anything. It has to start with him. That's why Paul says, in, de- in Christ are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You can't reason up, down, or sideways without Christ's help. And we're not ashamed of him. We're not ashamed to say, I start with Jesus. I don't try him. I don't test him. I don't see if his claims are any good. He talks, and I say, yes, Lord. Yes, I believe you. We need Jesus to make proper moral evaluation. You don't decide for yourself, well, I think this is good, this is bad, this may be right, and this may be wrong. He'll tell you how to live. And this is hard because we are fallen creature. We're fallen human beings. I mean, we're image bearers of God, no question. The the image of God is still on us, even in a fallen world. But if you're going to try to make proper moral evaluation and chart a course for your life without God's help, Well, guess what? You have some sensitivity in your heart to his moral imperatives, to his moral standards. Yes, you do, but guess what? Sooner or later, you will just wander into disaster. There is a reason why he gave us a Bible. There's a reason for this. Because there are truths here in this precious book that you just couldn't know any other way. And the book of Ecclesiastes goes into some detail about this. There's a reason why God has spoken to us to help us to navigate through this life, to determine what's true and what's false and what's good and what's bad and what's right and what's wrong. We desperately need him. I mean, that was the song we sung before I began preaching. Lord, we need you. And those are not empty words, friends. We need him desperately. Amen, brother. I'm sure many of you are thinking it. I think Nathan's thinking it. (laughs) Amen, brother. God's word navigates us through this life. It helps us. Most importantly, his word makes us wise unto salvation. It's his word that tells us how we can be reconciled to a holy God, how it happened, how it can happen, how we can be acceptable to God. How can reconciliation be made? Only one way, by the blood of that cross. That's it. Thank you. Jesus Christ was in the garden agonizing. He said to his disciples, I'm sorrowful to the point of death. You ever been sorrowful to the point of death? Many of us have. Jesus knows. He said, I'm sorrowful to the point of death. He said, Father, if there be any other way, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Wasn't possible. There's only one way to make reconciliation, 
There's only one way to bring sinners into communion with God, and that's through the blood of his cross, Jesus Christ's cross. That's it. No other way. And it's the only way to be acceptable to God, to come by the way of the cross. And Paul says you are acceptable in that beloved one, in Jesus. You are in Christ and acceptable to God. I mean, what a trade. You can't imagine a deal like this. Jesus says, I will take your sin and put it, in my, I'll put it on my body as I hang on that tree. There, your sin has been taken from you. Oh, but I'm not done yet, says Jesus. Now I'll give you my righteousness. When God looks at you, he will see my righteousness. I, I can't even fathom this. This is a mystery that we will be pondering into eternity for endless ages. We will be wondering about this. Why did you do it, God? Why did you do it? Why would you save a bunch of wretched people who would have turned their back on you, who did turn their back on you? We came into the world children of wrath, and we ignored him, denied him, did our own thing, and he pursued us anyways, and he called us to believe in him, and he drew us to the cross. That's a mystery of mysteries, an expression of love like none other, like no other. There is no other expression of love like that one. And Paul said it, that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Peace, the accompanying peace that this brings, even when life is hard, at the end of it all, at the rock bottom foundational level, there is a peace that God does not abandon those who love and trust him. And he has made a solemn declaration of this by that empty cross and that empty tomb. Paul says these are treasures. These are absolute, priceless treasures. And Paul says, don't be cheated. Keep your eyes open. Don't get robbed. Beware that you don't get cheated, that you don't get robbed or spoiled or impoverished. How can that happen? by following the world's demand for neutrality. You don't just take the Bible at face value, do you? You should enter into this thing in neutral fashion. Just follow the evidence where it leads. Find out if the Bible is trustworthy. You know, doesn't that sound very reasonable? For the Christian, absolutely not. That's not reasonable. Whose word, other than God, comes with its own credentials? Whose word, other than God's word, is self-authenticating? Needs no footnotes, nothing to back it up. God's word is the ultimate authority and the final court of appeal. God's word. And this neutrality that the world wants us to display is really a failed attempt at autonomy. It's, 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 uh, it's the enticement to you and to me to make the rules up for yourself. Just, just do what you think is best. Believe what you think is best. That's, that's not neutrality. That's autonomy. And that's disastrous. Why? Because if man is the measure of all things, dear friends, then you don't have any assurance of anything, you don't have any knowledge of anything, and you don't have any hope at all in this world. Why not? Because there is no good reason to trust the deliverances of man's reason. If man is just some kind of accident that's come flung into the world by total accident, random, purposeless, chance, here we have man now. What good reason is there to trust the, the deliverances of his mind? The mind was not really designed to apprehend truth or to make proper moral evaluation. If we just write God out of the picture, man's just some kind of accident. And there is no good reason to think that any of his thinking is really mapping onto reality or that man is really or could be ever morally upright. See what I mean? We actually need God moment by moment. We need him. Without him, we are just accidents, and in fact, we are disasters. Right? And I'm sorry, you don't have to come to church and hear all this stuff, but this is an encouragement to just listen to God and follow his ways, even when it's hard. But there's a principle here. You turn away from God and what he is saying to us, and you're going to find yourself impoverished. If it goes far enough, you, you may lose your wealth, like physical wealth too. 
mean, if you start trafficking into all kinds of uh, expensive addictions and things like that, well, the bank account will get vacuumed out real, real quick, and you may find yourself physically impoverished, but more importantly, you may find yourself impoverished and spoiled and robbed of those real treasures, like peace and joy and wisdom and knowledge and all such things that Christ wants you to have, for heaven's sakes. He wants you to have life and have it more abundantly and to walk uprightly and to have peace knowing that you're walking with Jesus. Well, let's go back to the book of Judges here and let's read about what happened. Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. When the people were crying out to God for some help, you know what he did? The first thing he did? He sent a messenger. He sent a prophet to bring clarity to the situation. People, after seven long years, people might have been thinking, Jeepers, this God, he really isn't very trustworthy after all. He really doesn't care for us. I mean, look what we're enduring. Uh, maybe we did the right thing following these fakey gods. And, and all of a sudden, you know, and they're crying out and they're, they're wanting some help here. And what does God do? He sends the prophet. The prophet comes and he brings clarity to the situation. He reminds Israel of her redemptive history. And he reminds Israel that God has been faithful. God did everything he said he was going to do, good things and the bad things, in response to unfaithfulness. God was being just. The judgment is just. God is not to be charged with wrongdoing. And what did this bring? This, br this brought conviction of sin and an attitude of repentance. And then and only then will God reveal himself in the person of his son, Jesus. And this is what happens here. Take a look at verse 11. All of a sudden, after the prophet has come and brought clarity, now this mysterious figure shows up, and we've seen him before. He's called the angel of the Lord. He's Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abzerite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? This is God's remedy here. God sends his son. This is God manifest in the person of his pre-incarnate son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see? Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, see, he's having a dialogue with the angel of the Lord. Next thing you know, it's the Lord himself. It's, it's him. It's the Lord Jesus now. God's ultimate disclosure of himself. And uh, we see a little kind of a sequence here that, that's going to get repeated for us. Do you remember in the New Testament? The Lord Jesus came into the world, God in the flesh, who came into, onto the world stage before the Lord Jesus, John the Baptist. Prophet first, then the Lord himself. You know what's going to happen at the end of days? God will send two prophets into the world, two special Jewish prophets. I think they will be Moses and Elijah. Not sure. Maybe Enoch will be there. I'm not sure. But he'll have two prophets before that great and terrible day when the Lord crashes through the skies and shakes everything that can be shaken. And the squatters will be booted from his planet. 
and he'll renovate the whole thing. And you and I will live there on a restored earth, restored to Eden-like conditions. And those who have loved and trusted Jesus will enjoy special rewards, privileges, responsibilities, and recognition. Before it happens, prophets, then the Lord. We, saw, kind of, we, we kind of saw the, the sequence there, didn't we, here? A little hint, a little foretaste. Well, I want to draw our attention to Gideon's complaint. Uh, Gideon has a complaint. It's a very common complaint. Maybe you've complained like this, too. Many atheists complain like this. Look at verse 13. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? Common, common complaint. If God is so great, how come I don't see any miracles? There's an atheist lawyer from Beverly Hills. His name is Edward Tabash. We've been debating Christians since the 90s. And I rather like Edward Tabash. Pray for him. I'd like to see him get saved. But that was his, he was raised in a Jewish home, Orthodox Jewish home. And the rabbis would talk about the Red Sea crossing and Edward Tabash would go to the ocean and he would look at that water and he would say, God, why aren't you doing it for me? I want to see you do a miracle. And this was his big, this was, he says this was his complaint. Why don't we see the miracles? I have some responses to that challenge. Maybe you have some of your own. The next time someone challenges you and says, if your God is so great, where's the miracles? Well, here's response number one. It's very hard for prideful people to hear this. We don't deserve them. Thank you. How's that? <laughs> How come God doesn't show me a miracle? Answer, you don't deserve it. God owes us nothing, friends. Remember Romans 11.35? Paul says, Who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? We owe everything to God. And we've talked about this before. Every breath is a gift. Every heartbeat's a gift. Your ability to reason, to make moral evaluation, your ability to reach right conclusions on things, your, reason, your ability to talk, fellowship you enjoy, friends, family, neighbors, things in this life that make you smile. He gave it to you all. He, all, he, all of it's his. He gave it to you. Generous in his character, generous. Your, your very identity. Your identity is not a physical thing. How much does your identity weigh? Can you paint it red? Bounce it on the ground? Your identity is not a physical sort of thing. It was given to you by God. Who you are first resided in the mind of God. And he's given you an identity, and you keep that identity. See, the amazing thing is, you have this identity as a fallen sinner who's headed for hell. And you come into a love-trust relationship with Jesus, and he changes your identity. Oh, new pedigree, new family history, new home in heaven, new citizenship. Completely new identity that you will keep forever. The world can take just about everything it wants from you. Did you know that? But it can't take away your identity in Jesus. It can't. Satan can't do it. Not, not if he were to gather all the world together and all the fallen angels, myriads of them, if he were to gather them all together and try to rob you of your identity in Christ, he couldn't do it. Not the entire created order together couldn't do it. I say hang on to that. Rejoice in that. We don't deserve miracles. Everything we have came from God. That's answer number one. Answer number two, I will admit this. Miracles convince some people. You remember in John, the fourth chapter, a very troubled parent came to Jesus looking for a miracle. Help my child. Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. He said that in John 4, 48. So you know what the Lord Jesus did? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't walk away from that father and say, well, forget it. I'm going to leave this guy in darkness. <laughs> you know what he did? He did a miracle. And the guy's whole household was saved. You remember Lazarus in, in uh, John 11? In John chapter 12, they had, a, they had a celebratory dinner in honor of Lazarus. Happy to, happy to have him back. And it says the Jews wanted to kill Lazarus again because by reason of him, many believed. Miracles under God, they do the job of convincing some people. Don't you think if a miracle is what you need, God would give it? A miracle isn't what most, most people need. What they need is a heart adjustment. 
Most people are hard to God. They don't care what they see. They don't care what evidence is brought before them. The Pharisees were shown all kinds of miracles. You know what they said? This man must be in league with the devil. Right? That's my next point. Miracles don't convince some people. In fact, it only adds to their condemnation. You and I, friends, and in fact, the entire created order of sentient, intelligible, intelligent beings are going to be judged by God according to how much light we received and how much we rejected. And the Pharisees were in, in danger of what? Greater damnation, Jesus said. You are, you are under greater damnation for a pretense. You make long prayers and flowing robes and you devour widows' houses. Greater damnation because you have a Bible and you can understand this and you are denying and suppressing the truth by means of unrighteousness. If Christ, you know, if Christ was to do a bunch of miracles today in the world in the sight of the non-believer, he would only add to that non-believer's condemnation if he would not receive Jesus. See, God knows what he's doing. He's very intelligent. Lastly, I'd like to say that there's a greater evidence for God than miracles. A much greater evidence for God than miracles, friends. And it's this. It's the law-like regularity of the created order that we see, have seen, and we expect to see in the future. You know, if I drop my keys, they hit the ground. That's how it happened yesterday. It's how it happened yes, the day before yesterday. Now, why is that? Why should it be that way? Why, why this regularity around here? Why this dependable regularity in the created order if the universe is just some kind of accident? And I'll, I'll ask something else. What's going on in your head that you think what you saw yesterday is a reliable guide to tomorrow? Why do you think that way? I'll give you an answer to both questions. The, the universe is a cosmos. It's an ordered creation. There is law-like regularity because God guaranteed that's how it's going to go. And you think the way you do because God has programmed you because he wants you to come to right conclusions on things. He has even programmed the non-believer to make right judgments on things so that the non-believer even can navigate through this life and be safe and earn money for himself, and balance his bank account, and drive a car, and all those things. See, that's a much greater evidence than miracles. It's an intelligible world. It's a world you can make sense of. You're the kind of creature that can think. You're the kind of creature that has a conscience. You're the kind of creature who can worry about things. Molecules in motion don't do those kinds of things. Can they? Physical objects don't work like that. There's something more to the created order than just a bunch of chemicals bouncing around. We are his image bearers. And every single day he talks to us. He reveals himself to us in, in our heart of hearts, in the created order, and in his precious book, the Bible. Our God, our great God, is the upholder, sustainer of the entire world, moment by moment, and he has taught us how to think. And that's why he's not real happy with some people's life choices. People who suppress and deny his truth by means of unrighteousness. They reason, they think, they make moral evaluation. They do all these things that God has equipped them to do, and yet they say, I don't believe in God. They don't glorify him. They don't thank him. They don't fall on their knees and say, thank you for all the good things I've enjoyed in this life. And that's serious. It's our job as his ambassadors, and we have nine more in our city, to show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To show people his goodness so that the goodness of God will lead to repentance. That's how people get saved, you know. They don't get saved by browbeating them. They don't get saved when you threaten them, bludgeon them, intimidate them, or manipulate them. They get saved when you tell them how great Jesus is. And the goodness of God leads to repentance. I love the Lord's words here in verse 14. The Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might that I uh, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Now that's it. This is the answer to skepticism right here. A divine command. It's an answer to Gideon's skepticism. And it's an answer to our skepticism, too. A divine command and a divine visitation. 
The divine visitation was the miracle that Gideon sought. Where's the miracles? And God appears to him. Here's the miracle. This is an answer to modern day skepticism. Where's the miracles? Oh, it's happened. God became a man. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh and hung on a tree for six hours and took the world's sin debt upon himself and rose from the dead on the third day, supreme vindication of his radical claims, offering life and peace and hope to a fallen and broken world. There's your miracle. You want a miracle? There it is. A divine command, the answer to the skepticism of our modern age. Listen to the divine command that rings out in our own day. Are you ready for this? Acts 17, beginning in verse 30. But now God commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. If I could just summarize what we've talked about this morning, I think I would do that by going to the book of Hebrews in the 12th chapter. To just summarize kind of what we've been talking about, I think we could break it down into three points. You like simple? Should I distill it down, what we've been talking about? Three points, real quick. Ready? Number one, resist the world. The whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5. Resist it. Resist that torrent going in the wrong direction, antagonistic to God's person, plans, and purposes. Resist and don't be spoiled of your treasures that you have in Jesus, accessible by faith. Make Jesus Christ the Lord in every area of your life. That's number one. And number two, there is abundant evidence for God. Think about it when you're having trouble in this life. Think about it. God is a rational and moral necessity who has spoken and continues to speak, friends. No God in the entire pantheon of fakey, phony, fictitious gods that has ever paraded itself across the mind of man could ever claim to be a rational and moral necessity, only our God. Without him, you can't reason, not up, down, sideways, or anything else. And you can't evaluate anything morally either. Our God is necessary. We can't live without him. And he has spoken, and he continues to speak, and our writer to the Hebrews wants to tell us this, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 25. You ready? A message for us, friends, that we really should take to heart. Let this penetrate. Verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only earth, but also heaven. There is a mighty, stupendous shakeup of the entire created order coming, dear friends. And our writer continues, and he says, But you who love and trust Jesus, you are the heirs of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. He's the reason for everything that's ever come into being, friends, and everything that ever will. He is our Savior, our Lord, the coming judge of the world and her king, and he's our very best friend. And he's the reason why we gather here week by week. How about a word of prayer? And we'll honor the Lord with one more song. Father God, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we want to declare before God Almighty, before men and angels, that Jesus Christ is truly great. We love him. We thank him. Seal the truths, Lord, that you have confronted us with today into all of our hearts and minds. May we go forth from this place walking in your marvelous light, being pleasing to you in every good word and work. And Father, bless and protect your people. Encourage us in the work. And Lord, may the goodness of God continue to lead people to repentance. Oceans of people, God, in our city. Bless the ministry of our visitors from down south and bless them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you all. Thank you so much.